one United Transportation Commission meeting. We'd like to call the meeting to order and we could start with roll call. Commissioner Aller. Here. Commissioner Brown. Here. Chair Johnson. Here. Commissioner Kane. Here. Commissioner Lewis. Here. Commissioner McCarthy. Commissioner Plum Smith. Here. Commissioner Richmond. Here. Commissioner Atri. Commissioner Clark. That's you, Anna. Commissioner Clark. <laughs> Here. Thank you. Commissioner Kariwala. Commissioner Kariwala. On and you're muted. Anand, can you hear me? Maybe he stepped away for a second. Oh, I'll yeah, send he's him a note in case I mean, that helps. Oh, real good. I said that along. It was here earlier. MJ, can I just keep going and come back? Okay. All right. Uh, would you be willing to share the agenda, Andrew? Yes. No, thank you. And uh, is there any discussion? And if not, would any? First of all, is there any discussion on changes to the agenda for today? Hearing none, would anybody like to make a motion to approve as presented? Move to approve so moved. the agenda. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Aller. Commissioner Brown. Aye. Chair Johnson. Here. I mean, I. Commissioner Kane? Aye. Commissioner Lewis? Aye. Commissioner Plum Smith? Aye. Commissioner Richmond? Aye. Agenda is approved. Thank you. And can we take a look at the minutes from our April meeting, please? Any discussion? Hearing none, motion to approve as written. Moved. Second. Great. Andrew. Commissioner Aller. Aye. Commissioner Brown. Aye. Chair Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Kane. Aye. Commissioner Lewis. Aye. Commissioner Plum Smith. Aye. Commissioner Richmond. Aye. Minutes are approved. Excellent. We've got a couple informational items up next. And thank you, MJ, for joining us. Would you like to introduce yourself and cover content and hand it over to Andrew for sharing screens? I would. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Perfect. OK. <laughs> So I just came from a community meeting, which it was a great community meeting. I'm going to put a plug that Bokar can share details with you because he was there. Um, hopefully at um, Commissioner comments, he can talk more about it, but I think it's good for you guys to know. Um, okay, so this year we're just trying this out to do a quick review um, member review. So bringing back some of that old contact content going in a little bit more to the details. So a little refresher for those that maybe just went through orientation. Hopefully a reminder for those um, that have already previously gone in the past. Um, Andrew should have included in your packet. Um, also the updated member handbook. Andrew, you, right? Okay, perfect. Um, which really is um, kind of our guide for our new members and we do update on an annual basis. So if this has been going really well. 
probably will continue to do something like this to re give out that member handbook on an annual basis as we update it and then maybe do a check in with our teams. So. Four main things I want to um, review today. You guys can see them on the 1st slide, the roles, communication, a little bit about our guiding documents. I have some updates on that and then spend a little bit of time on work plan development as you guys are about to go into that. Um, here's a reminder of roles. So this is the graphic that we commonly use to kind of explain how we structure um, our commissions and what our roles are when it relates to staff and also um, city council. So if we think about it, council is that overarching strategy and that they are really making those decisions or kind of that body that makes those decisions. As staff, we manage operations, program services. We really are that technical expert um, and we help provide recommendations or advice to council. Then we have our commissions like yourself that you are um, advising council, so you're advisory in nature. And really what um, we ask of our commissions is to bring that community perspective. And I think it's important for you guys to understand um, that this is part of your role to actually be that engagement um, part of community engagement. Um, in the city of Edina, we use a spectrum, which is by the International Association for Public Participation. So it kind of helps us define to what level of participation we're gonna, when we're doing a project, what level we're gonna actually be doing the public participation. Um, and this next slide, is actually the spectrum and you can see where boards and commissions fall on this. So actually boards and commissions, the advisory group that you are part of is a technique for public participation. This is one way that we get to the far right of our spectrum at that collaborate level where we're really working with a group of individuals who's bringing that um, level of engagement to different topics. On the left hand side, you can see all those other things where we're just informing people. So a lot of times that's our website, um, city extra. The consult, which is a common one that you guys will see, we send out surveys, we ask people for feedback, et cetera. So it's good for you guys just a reminder that you were picked by council um, and council wants to hear from you. So it's really you as a body being that community perspective and bringing that forward to city council. I love this slide because it's a great snapshot um, to kind of show the differences between our four advisory um, groups. So commissions like yourself, you're a standing body. Um, and I th would say that's the biggest difference is this that our commissions are our only bodies that are ongoing. Everything else is temporary in nature, ad hoc in nature. The other thing that really is important for you guys to remember is the scope of the work each group does. So you guys have a work plan, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later. That's where your scope of work is defined. Subcommittees, which are those smaller groups of the commission, they typically are put together to work on a work plan item. Same with a working group. Obviously, we're always asking for public members to serve on that as well. And then we do have this fourth group, task forces, which I'm sure you've heard of. Oh yes, because you guys had a member who served on one at one point. Um, those are, defined by a charge that they have a specific task that they're supposed to do. So this is a good snapshot. All of this is in detail in your um, handbook as well. Um, so difference between your chair, um, Kirk, and then also your staff liaison, um, Andrew, these are kind of the differences between those key roles. Your chair is helping or working with the liaison and preparing that agenda, leads the meetings like You've been doing lovely today, um, facilitating that discussion, helping facilitate that development of the work plan, um, encouraging them for participation and managing any conflict that may arise. So on the flip side, Andrew, what his role is going to be supporting the chair with that agenda and preparation of any meeting mater materials. He's in charge of all that legal stuff and making sure that we're um, not um, um, or that we're in following our open meeting law, um, maintaining the records, preparing the minutes. He's that technical expertise um, and access to the city staff and resources and also helps you relay, relay your information back to city council. So just looking at the two different um, main roles and how um, what the responsibilities are. These are the five ways of communication with city council. So you are familiar with all these meeting minutes. You just approved yours. Those are going to go to city council. Your work plan, you know, that was approved by city council and that's what they're directing you to work on. Your joint work session, I think you had. I can't remember. Maybe not. Andrew. What's the question? The joint work session. Did you guys already have yours? No, ours is in September. Okay, perfect. So that's another great way that you actually can communicate with council and you're going to be providing them a progress update on your work plan. 
Um, staff reports, those are written by Andrew that are actually um, supposed to gather information and send up to city council. Typically, those are going to include um, or include whatever the commission discussed or how they went about something, potentially their recommendation, in addition to also that staff's recommendation as well. And then advisory communication, these are used a little bit less often, but it's good for you guys to know that these are available. That if you do happen to have something that comes off comes up during the year, that's not on your work plan, but you just want to make sure you get information to city council about the topic. You can use this um, template, which is a um, information that's written by um, typically a member or a couple of members of the commission, but approved by the entire commission to be forwarded to city council. So. Andrew um, can support you guys with this, but that's just a little difference between um, your options for communicating with council. Um, here's your update on guiding documents. City code was just updated um, as related to our boards and commissions. Um, we also have our policies and procedures, which really essentially is that member handbook that we gave you and we update that on an annual basis. Um, and then you have your work plan. So those are your main guiding documents. One thing that's missing here um, is bylaws. We no longer have bylaws. Um, about, I think like 3 weeks ago, city council rescinded all of the bylaws for commissions. Um, we discovered, we did a review like late last year and, and realized that a lot of the information in our bylaws was repeat content that already existed in other documents. And then we found some conflicts and it seemed like it was more challenging to try to keep up with 3 to 4 different documents. And so, um, very little was in bylaws that we actually took and moved into like city code or policies and procedures. So that's where we're at. So you have three different um, guiding documents um, for the commission. Okay, I'm gonna can, yep. can, I, can I ask a quick question? I, I realize that like those are the guiding documents, uh, I think specific to bo boards and commissions in terms of their operation. Wouldn't mm -hmm. the comprehensive plan be a guiding document in terms of the content sure. it, for the boards? Right, and yes, any strategy documents, um, the comprehensive plan obviously covers all of our commissions, but any other strategic plan that's applicable to any of the work that you're doing for sure. The one specific to operations of boards and commissions, it's going to be these three and like how we actually conduct business and do our work. Good call. Are there other questions? Because usually I pause here before we jump into work plans. No. All right. All right. We'll keep going. Okay, so here's your work plan calendar. Um, we are down in that box that has the yellow around it, which really is um, the work plan development. So this is June through August. So next month you should see on your um, agenda, um, Andrew should be adding, you know, 2022 work plan development where you're gonna start discussing or dropping different ideas of what you think you might wanna work on in 2022. Um, in July, we're gonna start filling out that template um, and you're gonna start adding in that information to give it a little bit more detail. And really in August, you should pretty much be just refining the last pieces of your work plan and approving it as a as an entire commission. Um, in September, that's when they get turned into me. Um, in October is when Kirk has another responsibility and has to present that proposal to city council. Um, November is when staff does a review of them and then finally council approves them in December and you start them in January. So I know it seems like we're starting really early. You've only really begun your 2021, but as you can tell, it takes so many months to actually accomplish this when we only really meet on a monthly basis. So here's those roles again um, for your chair versus Andrew helping you out. Um, but that chair is gonna help lead that work plan development, making sure it's not overloaded. We definitely want you guys to have success. Um, ensure there's a lead. There's gotta be someone who kind of takes, you know, the lead of an in initiative we can't, if we put one on there, no one wants to do it, then there's really no reason to have the initiative on a work plan in the first place. Um, and then also that chair is going to present it, the proposed work plan to city council. So Andrew, things that he's going to help you with is providing you technical expertise and recommendations along the entire way. So look to him for advice and different um, information that may help guide when you're developing that work plan. He's not going to steer you wrong. Um, he's going to try to make sure that you guys have a clear recommendations um, to um, staff so that we can understand it and ensure that everything is complete and move it through that process. So a little bit different and difference in those roles. These are my tips for you guys. Um, and Andrew is going to reinforce these as you guys are going through this entire process. But um, some of these are fields that are actually on your work plan. So the title be as clear as you can and provide the detail. 
it's really tough for us sometimes when I read a work plan item at, at staff review and we can't understand exactly what it is. So it kind of leaves us in a spot to like, is this what they're doing or is this what they're doing? So as much as you can help us with that, the outcome is a great field. We added that one last year that actually helps us understand what the intent of the initiative is as well. But what's the end result? Like at the end, when you're done, what is actually going to be the result? Um, budget, I put this one on here. Um, so just so you guys know, as commissions, you don't have a budget and you can't approve spending of funds. That's a staff function. It's it's so legally you can't, it's a staff function. And if you are asking for budget or funding, it's important that you list it here so that one, your department, the department who may oversee the group knows about it. And if it's going to be a huge impact, you know, council needs to be aware of potential implications if a commission is asking for a larger budget. Um, liaison comments, Andrew's gonna give you information along the entire way. So really anything that goes down here at the very end, you should have already heard from Andrew, but we gotta gather that information to guide us as well. Um, target completion date, be as realistic as you can. The time I will tell you that it, it's the most difficult is if you're planning something or an initiative that actually is gonna impact like a supporting department. And I would say communications is probably the top one. That if you say your event's going to be in October, they've got it on their calendar, they're ready to rock and roll. But if you adjust that, that kind of sways their entire annual calendar as well. Um, and then partner projects. This is not on your work plan, but this is a common one that comes up. And I think you guys have a situation right now where you are partnering and across commission. Um, here's the success of these. Where essentially, if you think that there's a secondary commission to work on something with, it works best to have one as a lead uh, where they ultimately are responsible for the movement of the work and then a secondary one to support that work. And typically it's a review and comment. Um, I think the one that you guys are um, working on together is EEC and organized hauling trash hauling. Is that right, Andrew, Nod? Yes, that's yeah. correct. Okay, so essentially how that works, and maybe you guys already talked about this. Is this repeating myself, Andrew? No, I was going to talk and talk more about it later on, but. Okay, so he, so essentially what it is, is that they are, they are the, wait, you guys are the lead. Well, who's the lead? We're, we're the lead. Yes. So you are going to be leading this work. The EEC is going to have a chance to review and comment on that work. And you guys kind of need to pre to predetermine, like, at what point does it make sense for us? Is it waiting till the very end to, do, to review and comment on our final recommendation? Or is there something maybe a little bit before that? But at a minimum, it should go to them at that end so that we can collect their comments to be included to city council. Um, but essentially, their work or that initiative item is kind of hinged on you guys as a group doing your work. So just think about that if you have a partner. Um, and think about workloads, like, does it make sense for us to do it or someone else to do it, et cetera. So, okay, questions on any of that? Or are you ready to move into your meeting? I got silence, Andrew. Okay, Andrew's here, you guys. He's got a lot of good information. If he has any questions, he'll always come to me. Of course, you can always reach out to me directly as well. But um, I hope you guys have a great meeting. And I will talk to you guys later. Thank Thanks. you, MJ. Thank you, MJ. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks MJ. Appreciate it. Thanks, MJ. Thank you. I don't know if people saw that little chat, but. I actually wondered also what OML was just before Mindy asked, and I had looked it up. So, um, open meeting law. And then she said it just as I hit enter yeah. on the question. Oh, yeah. She said it, and I realized that's what it was. Hey, Anand, say here. Just say here. Here. Real good. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. All right, okay, ready to move next, on? Yeah, safe routes to schools engineering study. All right, so this will be pretty brief. The full report was enclosed in your packet. Um, I just kind of wanted to briefly review um, the, the kind of the process and the, the findings of this study and kind of what the city is planning to do with it 
or next steps. Um, so in, in late 2019, um, the uh, MINDAT opened a solicitation period for basically to fund safe routes to school engineering studies. Um, these are intended to basically bridge the gap between a city safe routes to school plan, which is typically a higher level look at improvements across the city um, to bridge a gap between those plans and actual project implementation. So in this case, we had the opportunity to either submit a study for an individual school or for two to three schools. Um, we ended up submitting for three schools that include Creek Valley, Cornelia, and Highlands Elementary. Um, and the study was prepared by uh, SRF Consulting Group um, and Commissioner Chris Brown was a member of the group that uh, drafted this study, so he may be helping answer some questions if there are any. Very cool, Chris. Yeah. So the um, this is kind of a, a broad look at the identified issues um, at these three schools. They in, fall into three main categories: the um, school property access and circulation. So this is mainly mainly involving the parking lots on the sites. Um, it was noted that access um, can cause some uh, safety and operational issues during the peak traffic periods, and that at some of these schools, um, particularly Cornelia and Creek Valley, the circulation is inefficient and, and limits the internal queuing capacity, which then results in vehicles queuing and spilling out onto the local streets. The second category is intersection crossings. Um, these uh, in certain areas can be barriers to for students to comfortably and safely walk, bike, or roll to school, um, and then multimodal connectivity. So what sidewalks and bike facilities are in the area adjacent to the schools that help um, improve uh, multimodal connectivity or access to the school? So these are the three kind of overview maps of the specific um, recommendations at each school. Um, so you can see the color coding here for um, potential sidewalks in green, bike lanes uh, in, in blue here. Um, most of those are already included in our Pet and Bike Master Plan or already recommended. Um, there's some there's a new one here on Wooddale and um, uh, this isn't Claremore. I want to say this is Dunham Drive. Um, but you can see the, the green outlined by the white. Those are sidewalks or bike or shared use paths or bike facilities that are not currently in the Ped and Bike Plan. Um, additionally, there's some crossing improvements that are recommended on 70th Street, on Cornelia Drive, and on 72nd Street. Um, which those of you that are familiar with the issues around this area, those probably don't surprise you. Andrew, yeah. Um, previous slide, thank you. 70th Street West, the legend notes potential bikeway, protected bike lane, or shared use path. Can you comment on what that means compared to the existing bicycle infrastructure on that road street? Isn't that already marked? Am I not remembering correctly for bicycle facility? It, it's marked, but it's not a protected bike lane. Okay. Yeah, it's a it's an on street uh, it's on street bike lanes right now, and I believe in the plan it's recommended be upgraded to to buffered bike lanes. Um, moving on to to Creek Valley, again you can see the various um, bike and shared use path recommendations, the sidewalk recommendations, most of which are aligned with the Pet and Bike Master Plan. There's a couple additions, um, a sidewalk here on Nordic Circle um, and a, a bike boulevard uh, to complement the proposed sidewalk along Indian Hills Pass into the Indian Hills and Indian Trails neighborhoods. Uh, you can also see there are a few different options uh, suggested to um, connect the school to the uh, Nine Mile Creek Regional Trail, um, which is something that we had Previously talked to the school district and the three rivers park district about, um, and then some, again, some crossing improvements noted at along Gleason at Creek Valley at Indian Hills pass and at, uh, McCulley trail. And then on highlands again, a number of sidewalks and bike facilities that are recommended. Um, 
the biggest difference from the Pet and Bike Master Plan is the Spike Boulevard that's uh, shown on uh, Ayrshire and um, Doncaster leading up to the school from Ayrshire. Um, crossing improvements at the school entrance on Doncaster Way, as well as at the intersection of Ayrshire and Vernon, um, which if you haven't, if you're not familiar with that area, it's a very wide crossing across Ayrshire there, um, and there's no crossing uh, at Vernon between Ayrshire and Hanson. Um, there's also this uh, sidewalk connection um, to the to the east from Ayrshire that's proposed um, that would help uh, connect more people to the school, uh, make it a shorter walking distance to the school than having to go all the way around Vernon or all the way around Ayrshire. Andrew, you might be getting to this, um, but how much of what's proposed in here is funded? How much of it is requested to be funded? Um, how should we think about the recommendations relative to them being implemented? So we, the city has a, um, I guess we didn't really, they're not really categorized as like funded or not funded. The, the city has a potential funding source to do all of these improvements. That's the, the pedestrian and cyclist safety fund. Um, it's just a question of when do we, how do we prioritize these improvements versus everything else that is proposed in the city? Um, and at what time frame? Because the PACS fund has a, we have a limited revenue per year, so we can only do a certain amount of improvements per year um, unless we, you know, seek outside funding and stuff like that. Does that oh. answer your question? It does. Yeah, thank you. I wasn't sure if this was all intended to be a study to add on to existing plans or to inform existing plans, so that helps clarify. Thank you. I was just going to add as well, um, there is up upcoming Safe Routes to School grant funding via MnDOT that will be announced over the summer and occur over the fall winter um, as a funding opportunity. We'll definitely be keeping our eyes on that. The, so these are, uh, in my opinion, these are excellent recommendations. Um, I, I have kind of a, a weird question and then um, and then I want to tag on to um, Andy's comment about the funding. Um, my weird question is, has Edina now given up the um, the active routes to school and actually gone back to the safe routes to school like the rest of the world? Because I, I was gratified to see it was um, presented as safe routes to school. And Chris, I don't know if you were in Edina when Edina refused to use that because they didn't want to be liable if they said it was safe. So they just called it active routes to school. So maybe Andrew, do you know? That's a fair question. So the the active routes to school plan is still in effect. That that plan from 2014 um, ha also has a number of recommended projects, um, but and some like survey data from the school board. It's it's kind of out of date, I would say, and needs to be updated. Um, and especially because a lot of those uh, recommended projects that were in that 14 plan have since been constructed, particularly a number of sidewalks and bike facilities that were recommended, like Valley View, Interlock, and Cornelia, we've we've since implemented those. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that it's it's my opinion that that study should be updated um, in the sometime in the coming years, just the same way that we update the comp plan or we update the pet and bike plan. Um, the, the reason why this is called a safe routes to school study is be just because that's the way that um, it was brand it was branded through MnDOT. So it's not it's it's meant to it's not meant to negate our active routes to school plan. It's meant to be kind of an update or a supplement to it. Well, maybe one way to update that is to actually use the language that the rest of the world uses, like the state of Minnesota and every other community. It just would make things a lot simpler. Um, okay, so uh, then tagging on to that um, and using that and then the funding. Um, Chris, was um, were, was the school district involved in any of this? And and do have they do they have any funding that could be committed to this? Yes, yeah, so we had a staff liaison from the school district. His name is <clears throat> excuse me, Eric. Um, and his last name is Eric. Is it Hamilton, Andrew? Hamilton. Yep. Um, he was the building and grounds director, so he was involved in our project team meetings throughout the entirety of the project. 
And so is it, is it possible that, um, that as, as these begin to be prioritized and I, you know, I, I guess that would be the next question. Is there a mechanism for choosing priorities based on maybe the, uh, the most cost effective, lowest hanging, most effective, um, safe routes. Um, and then once there's sort of an order of priority, is it possible that there's a partnership between the school district and, and the city and maybe the grant funding? I'm not sure who that's a question for. Maybe you, Andrew? I can take it. Yeah. Um, and so for most of these projects, um, they, they either are um, a city project because they're within city right of way, they're off of school property or they're a city school project because they're completely on school property. Um, and really the, the key, the key um, difference I see there are the, the parking lot improvements are not really something that the city can initiate because it's on school district property. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm not aware if the school district has any upcoming plans to, um, to implement any of these recommended parking lot reconfigurations. Um, but I, I think it's fair to say that it's something that they're keeping in mind as they do their capital improvement planning um, and as they are as they schedule improvements in these three schools. Um, we would hope that they would look for opportunities to implement the recommendations of this study. Um, similarly, with the sidewalk and bike projects, um, we will look for opportunities to implement them as part of scheduled street recons, for example, um, but the. Um, they'll also be the ones that are in the pet and bike plan. Um, those will have the equity criteria applied to them. So then they'll fall into that prioritization. Okay. It, it does sort of make sense to me that there may be sort of an, uh, an implementation planning group that is both school district and city. Uh, because I mean, it seemed, it would seem ludicrous if highest priority, because it's consistent with the master bike plan, uh, we do a, a you know a bike route or sidewalk or whatever uh, that leads into a parking lot that's not going to be redone for the next three years. So it's like it, you would think there would have to be a joint group that would do the planning on the priorities and sort of align the outside the school, inside the school work. And now I'll shut up. Just a thought. No, that's that's a good thought. Thanks. I appreciate the the comment. Um, so that kind of leads into the, the next steps. Um, so as I already mentioned, some of the, the um, sidewalks and bike facilities that are recommended here um, are consistent with the pet and bike master plan. There are some that aren't. Um, again, just like the active routes to school plan, the, the pet and bike plan is three years old now and was intended to be updated every couple of years. Um, unfortunately, 2020 kind of threw a wrench into things. Um, so we're we're reevaluating when we're going to be able to um, conduct a, another community engagement process to update the pet and bike plan. But that is something that I'm interested in doing in the coming years. And as part of that process, I would like to look at incorporating the additional facilities that are recommended by this study into the new plan. Um, additionally, there are some notes about in in each of those study areas to review um, school zone signage along Gleason, along 70th, and along um, Vernon and Doncaster. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this later on, but we're almost done preparing our implementation plan for the 25 mile an hour speed limits. Um, and as part of that, we're reviewing the existing school zone signage and looking for areas where we can make um, improvements, not only at these three schools, but at all of the, for all the school zones in the city. Um, as I mentioned before, the sidewalks and bike facilities, we're planning to prioritize using the equity criteria. Um, one note, one thing that I kind of found interesting with the, um, the crossing uh, improvement recommendations, um, at kind of a quick glance, looking at those areas that are recommended, comparing that to what our current pedestrian crossing policy uh, recommends based on traffic volume and roadway characteristics and things like that, there's, it's kind of inconsistent. Um, there's some, uh, there's some areas where, for example, an RFB is recommended where based on our current policy, it, we may not have a reason to do it. So, um, and another factor to take into account is that our current policy for determining when or what type of 
crossing treatment is warranted is partially based on speed. And since we're going to be reducing a number of streets down to 25 miles an hour, that changes what kind of treatment they can get. So I think it's my opinion that after the speed limits are implemented that um, it's worth looking at that pedestrian crossing policy again to see if we need to reevaluate the warrants. Um, and then again, we'll, the city will continue to coordinate and, and advocate for um, improvements that are not, can't really be city led. Um, those are the ones that involve Edina Public Schools, um, the county, there's improvements on um, Gleason and Vernon that are recommended, and then uh, MnDOT primarily for the um, some uh, lane configuration recommendations on Gleason over Highway 62. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions. I have one, a... more new, one more new guy question, either for you and Andrew or maybe for Chris. What are the current criteria for enhanced crossing? I forgot the acronym you just said, but what? How does that work currently? What would what was necessary to qualify for the beacon? Sure. The let's see. I have to pull up the policy quick. To I don't know it off the top of my head, but it's we've got, there's a flow chart generally that basically okay. that's based on um, the the traffic volume of the road the um, the posted speed limit, um, whether, you know, the, what type of sight lines are, are visible, whether it's stop controlled or not, um, pedestrian volume, all of those kind of play, play a factor into what treatment is recommended. So I, I, uh, after the meeting, I can send you the full policy. And if you have any additional questions, I'd be happy to answer them. No, is that'd be great. Don't need to take up more time here. Is width of the road included in that, Andrew? It seemed like the number of lanes also is. Yeah, the the width, not necessarily the width, but the lane configuration. Yes, right. that is also a factor. Whether it's it does, two lanes, it four lanes, whether it has a median. Yeah, I, it makes sense to me that um, after the speed limit uh, implementation, that uh, that policy does get looked at again. And given the knowledge now that um, of the safe routes to school, it might be uh, there might be a consideration for those crossings within school zones. Uh, because we're talking about a younger population, a more vulnerable population, that kind of thing. So there, there might be, and that might go to the equity criteria, I'm not sure, um, but it, it would be worth looking at. Sure, and to be fair, there is some kind of special consideration within the current policy that addresses areas near schools. Um, but even that I think could be, um, could be looked at again. I was just going to quick out. I think that's why sometimes our recommendations varied from local policy because we're also using some other state and national guidance and kind of marrying all those together. Obviously, local policy takes pre precedent, but we were trying to use the lens of a child using the crossing versus um, just anyone. So this mostly why those variations may exist, but um, Nope, you're muted, Kirk. Oh, suggestion, and maybe it's covered somewhere else, Andrew or Chris. Um, or what do people think about the inclusion or next steps that would be education and, and encouragement? <clears throat> the reason I bring those up are some of the letter E's that the League of American Bicyclists likes to recommend. Chris, you're nodding your head. So we can build great infrastructure, but having education, which I think is a a gap from what little I know uh, in Edina for road safety. So comments on that? I would plug the other ease too, just because as we're working with MnDOT on these other safe process school studies for the upcoming grant application, they really stress that communities show how they're also implementing the other safe routes ease. Um, so to your point, it's a, it's a good, um, policy just to kind of get into play and and implement those with either a committee or you know some sort of team school district and citywide um, mm -hmm. for yeah education enforcement engagement I guess enforcement might not that one's up in the air but yeah the other is maybe maybe I could um, offer to ask Anna and Anand maybe put you on the spot a little bit but do you recall in any of your I don't know FIED classes or whatever they call it now, do they, or even uh, your recent experience if you've taken driver's ed, do they 
cover things like bicycle uh, road safety? Um, yeah, actually they do cover just what to do when a bike is coming, but honestly, um, it's not very extensive, like covering the bike lanes and what to do when there is a bike coming, but yeah, it's only covered just slightly. So not a lot of teen drivers know what to do. I would agree being a cyclist and a driver, I think they as and i said it's very um they they don't really go in depth about it they just say you know watch for them and they're there so, you know stay a little stay away from them a little bit but i think that's about it and then one last one chris do you, did you hear or is is part of this maybe encouraging ways to measure or reward walking i mean when it's appropriate and safe or like rolling and those other ways to get to school, uh, ways that can make it fun or um, like yeah, I would, to, to try it out. I would plug, um, I used to work in, in Colorado and Boulder County had a really excellent and robust safe routes to school program. So they would have Boulder Bucks and they would provide those to the students that walked or biked to school and area businesses would, would, su would support the Boulder Bucks um, as real cash for, whatever the students wanted to buy. So that was like an incentive item. And then they also doubled that as a data collection item because they could track then student tallies for the data that was being collected and parent survey information too, which are two critical areas for um, data collection for safe routes to school. So I can, I can share the link. Um, I use that as some research for this, for these. Those sound like well. uh, examples of great programs that our schools could consider even even sooner than later. Something to add on that note, I'm not sure if this is actually sanctioned or has any partnership with our group, but um, in an anecdote on that regard, any kind of police officer stopped uh, my two kids on Valley View last week, um, which is concerning, except he gave them coupons for ice cream at Dairy Queen because they were wearing helmets. So. Um, I have no idea if that's a transportation program or a police program or some other program, but um, I'll tell you it worked. Um, so I don't know if that's something we're involved with or it was just random, but um, something like that beyond in addition to school programs, I think really could have an impact. So a quick question here. The, uh, this Safe Route to School program, first of all, I think it's a phenomenal one. It's just beautiful to see a study as such done because in my mind, I always had the thinking, I would love to see every kid bike from their neighborhood to their schools, be able to do it safely. I think that would contribute tremendously, tremendously to reaching that goal. But for this Safe Route to School, my question would be, do they, um, do you, for the implementation piece, do you use the school, the city, to be able to do that implementation? Is it like a permanent installation, or would this be first a temporary one where you involve the, the, the student, the community, they come, they put it down and see how it works is that is that the same thing or is it this one is different it's a it's a phenomenal study yeah so there there are <clears throat> safe routes to school um i'm blanking on the term right now but they're demonstration projects thank you thank you chris demonstration projects um where uh agencies do exist like exactly what you described they do a temporary uh installation um and review it for a period of time and get feedback on it before considering to implement something permanent. Um, and I mean, a, a recent example uh, we looked at a couple years ago were the curb extensions on 72nd Street south of uh, just south of Cornelia Elementary. Um, we painted curb extensions and then put in bollards and studied it and got feedback. Um, but uh, there are other agencies that do, you know, take a section of the road and stripe out a bike lane or a a walking path and get feedback on that. Um, 
the uh, opportunities to do that kind of vary from area to area because you have to take into consideration the the width of the road. You need to, you know, we still need to be able to provide adequate room for vehicle traffic. And then on street parking is kind of the big uh, thing factor that you have to take into consideration. Um, usually doing a project like that um, in a lot of cases requires you to temporarily remove the on street parking. I would say also MnDOT offers grant funding for Safe Rasa of School demonstration projects, um, either annually or biannually. That's correct, and I think I forwarded that to the city not long ago because I'm very well involved in, in like a temporary Safe Rasa School project with MnDOT on my business side. Those are great, and I, I think maybe we must have missed the deadline because the MnDOT would give you the money and all the study. I think all you need to do is just bring the the people to implement it, right? Try it and see, and then before, if it's all good, people like it, you move it to a permanent. Yeah, at, at this point, we don't really have any um, demonstration projects in mind. We're the you know we're we're fortunate enough to have a reliable funding source to be able to build permanent infrastructure. So that's Great. that's kind of what what I've been focusing on. But okay. um, certainly, if the if a neighborhood or a community showed strong interest in hosting or doing a demonstration project, that could be something we could look into, and um, we could look at covering it with the PACS fund or with you know available grant funding. I, th I think that would be a phenomenal idea because this will allow us to really hit that comprehensive plan we worked on 2018, and do all those connections we talked about between the north and moat, making sure. Also that when it back today, back to school comes for the kid, they can just do that without any safety concerns. Sure, yeah, that's a good suggestion. But it's uh, absolutely a phenomenal work that has been done here. I have to say, see why I was so excited about getting Chris on this commission. <laughs> <laughs> Any other Jeff, questions on this one? I do have just one more, which is how did those th how how was it that those three schools were the ones selected for the study? We primarily deferred to the school district um, to kind of let let them pick areas where. Um, they receive a lot of complaints and uh, they, I mean, more or less align with areas where the city frequently gets complaints. Not, or not necessarily, I shouldn't say uh, complaints, but also concerns. I do think um, maybe that grant money's all gone and maybe it's not an opportunity, but uh, gosh, Valley View Middle School. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I do think that um, having three elementary schools that really are a problem, particularly for everything from drop off to, to um, kids biking and walking. Uh, but Valley View Middle School, I, I know that you get tons of complaints about that area up by the high school and the middle school. So could be an opportunity to do a one-off, but there you go. So you're saying that maybe the the temporary safe after school program would qualify for that. I don't know how much of this I can talk about because I do a lot of this project part of my business, but I think it's just stellar. I mean, I've done these in different communities. It's just low cost and absolutely effective. So maybe Valley View can qualify for one of those grants for next year. Yeah, Valley View is something we've we've looked at multiple times and discussed in length with the with the school district, um, and we're, we're always looking for opportunities to, you know, make changes or uh, fix the situation out there. I want to put a, a plug in for our resource site 
I think this will be a great asset so we can quickly re review it and retrieve it when we want in upcoming years. Yeah, yeah, I can certainly post it there. And I, I still don't understand how to get to it. I think we'll when talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, let's okay. let's do that. Good good point, Mindy. Should we be moving on? Am I supposed to say that? Should we yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. Yes, good discussion. Uh, Thanks. I like the summary you prepared, Andrew. And if I remember right, we've got um what is next on the agenda? Uh, the Cloveride like service contract renewal. So that's the five pages for feedback on that. Yep. So Does anybody um, have a chance? Go ahead, Andrew. Oh, I, I so uh, in your packet is the kind of the draft um, request for purchase to renew the service for another year um, and the, the draft service contract. Um, so our service with darts, uh, we we uh, enter into agreements for on an annual basis. So our current contract expires on June 14th. So we uh, have to renew it soon in order to avoid a, a lapse in coverage. Um, as as Mindy and I have mentioned in, in previous meetings, you know, the, our uh, ridership dropped pretty significantly during the pandemic, but we've uh, in recent weeks have been seeing it uh, come back to pre COVID levels. Um, in my report, it mentions uh, we're at nine riders a week between January and April. Um, the latter months of those, some some weeks are 10 or 11 riders, um, and 15 is what we typically saw before the pandemic. So there's encouraging signs that more people are starting to use the service again. Um, and the feedback that we've gotten from the surveys is very positive. Um, a lot of people really enjoy the service and find it useful for their daily lives. Um, so I'm recommending renewing the contract for another year with darts. Can I ask what you, what you, are you wanting an action from the commission? Are you wanting us to approve it? Just be aware of it, uh, offer feedback. What are you wanting us to do on it? Because it seemed kind of like matter of course kind of stuff to me. Good question. So this initiative on the work plan is is a review and comment. So I'm not looking for any action uh, from the commission. I'm just looking for any feedback or comments you want to make um, that would be included in my report that would go to council. In my opinion, you've kind of hit the the key things. It's a it's a useful um, transportation service. Uh, it's used. It's increasing again, and in it's uh, in its ridership. And we should renew for another year. So I think you've kind of, as far as I'm concerned. I echo that. Mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah. Yeah, and since since I have joined the committee or whatever our, the correct terminology is um, for the Clover Ride. I mean, I've come to appreciate even more the additional benefits that they provide of the socialization for people too, and how important that really is um, with COVID that people feel even more isolated and this is giving them a chance to get back out again. Um, and I've just really come to appreciate the way that DARTS in particular operates this service for us in particular, um, that they are very open to modifying the route slightly according to people's preferences, even to things that are a ways off of the route. They just make things work. And that's something that never gets written into a contract, but I think it's an additional benefit that we get from working with DARTS. As an aside, Andrew, um, have you talked with uh, like the Community Health uh, Commission to get their feedback? Because I would guess that a number of the people who ride uh, ride this um, circulator bus 
maybe some of the folks that the Community Health Commission is interested in serving, and they may have a, a support, you know, a, a statement of support for it as well, specific to what Mindy said, you know, helping with uh, things like a sense of isolation versus a sense of community, um, acts, accessibility, those kinds of things. Anyway. Sure. It's, it's not on their work plan. It's not something that I had planned to do, but that's certainly something I can uh, offer to council as a consideration. Any other discussion for Clover? Should we move on to traffic study? The traffic um, report safety. Sure, I'll share my screen here again. Everyone see this okay? Yep. Andrew, do you walk through this or do I? Uh, typically, it's been the chair, but I can if you'd rather. Um, I, I'm comfortable doing it. What's whatever is typical. Um, uh, feel free to, I mean, please help out as you need to. Of course. So the first one, A1, uh, for recommending action. Um, comments on this Sunny's, Sunnyside Road where the staff recommends clarifying with the end sign. That seemed to make sense to me. Me too. Makes sense. Agreed. Okay. Moving on. Uh, the next one is um, getting, getting rid of a sign. So um, not serving a purpose. And I thought that one was great. Any comments? I apologize. It's kind of a boring, kind of a boring traffic safety report this month. Oh, that's all right. Uh, can can those uh, signs go up for bid and people use them for decor in their basements or their garages? Uh, I can give you a number for Public Works if you want to talk. If you want to offer that to them, they usually salvage the signs to uh, salvage the metal to use for a different sign. That makes sense. All right, and then see here. No further study. Uh, listing here. I think usually we just ask if anybody wanted to bring up any for discussion. Just give people a moment to glance at those if, if you need a refresher. If none, can we move on to D where there's um, just a variety of other things handled? Any any discussion comments on those? Looks like we're ready for the work plan updates. All right. Do we just proceed into that? We don't need to make any formal closure on the traffic study. Is that right, Andrew? Yeah, that would only be if the commission is making a, a separate recommendation on an item. Then Great. that would okay. that would require a vote. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so, Jill, um, I know you've yes. worked hard, and there's been some good progress notes here for organized trash collection. Ah, uh, yes, garbage organized trash collection. Um, so we had a midterm meeting on. Uh, April 16th, the day after our last commission meeting. And as it turns out, um, the students had done a lot more uh, research in terms of what other cities are doing. Um, we just didn't know about it. They had written up a few questions for a community survey uh, in terms of um, collecting garbage. And we had planned to uh, put that out on uh, next door. Um, but I believe the city wanted to put that on hold, if I'm correct, Andrew, um, and maybe we can evaluate those kinds of questions at a later date, but that's not really in the scope of this uh, project right now. Is that correct, Andrew? Yeah, I think the, there's a, 
a couple of concerns that that the city had. One was um, the fact that we the city's already done some polling about organized trash collection through the quality of life survey. Um, and that survey, the the distribution of that survey is um, done to a certain standard that may not be matched by a, a, a new survey that's distributed through Better Together or next door. Um, so the uh, kind of where we landed was the the commission is free to make recommendations for future polling that the city may look into, but um, at this point, the actual doing the polling was seen to be outside the scope of the initiative for this year. Great, thank you. Um, the second thing um, that we had determined at the last meeting is that um, uh, the city offered to have cameras at two intersections during trash collection days, and that data came back in and has shared it with um, the Vantage group. Uh, it's really interesting data. Um, I did ask Aiden, uh, the student group leader today, if he could extrapolate um, like garbage truck traffic with percentage of uh, noise emission, and he he can do that, um, and we'll include it in the final report. Um, and the final report is coming in on May 25th. Um, once we have that report, uh, we'll analyze it and uh, take the recommendations, plus add our own, and then um, I'll bring it back to you all, hopefully uh, by June. Um, having said that, um, if anyone would like to join uh, in on organized track collection, that would be great. Um, I know uh, the students haven't been um, involved that much due to COVID. Um, so if the students want to be in on next recommendations or in on the report, I'm not quite sure when the when are the students done. Andrew, August would be August would be the last August. meeting for the oh, current great. students. Great. So if they want to join in on and uh, further research, because it will just be um, the Transportation Commission and not with the Vantage Group, that would be great. But if anyone else um, wants to join me on some analysis, um, that would also be great. Does anyone have any questions or concerns? I guess just something to add, um, <clears throat> echoing back to what MJ had said earlier. Um, this initiative is on the EEC's um, work plan to review and comment on the report. So um, just reminding you to include them in your timeline um, before your, you know, make sure you get, we get feedback from them before um, the final report is submitted to council. Oh, sure. And they did get the, our, our latest report, correct, for this month? They the did, latest yes. Latest update? Okay. Excellent. Any questions or concerns from them? Sorry. Were there any questions or concerns from the EEC as far as you know? They had some questions about um, participating in the development of the study, um, which staff kind of discussed because it's that is kind of outside the again, outside what their approved work plan item was. Um, so I can I'll pass along the comments that they provided um, if you're interested in them. But for now, we're um, kind of asking them to to wait until the commission approaches them um, to participate. Okay. That sounds great. And and um, until we see their final report, um, I'm not quite sure how we'll proceed, but we'll see what they have to say and then and then move forward appropriately. Sure. This is Lori. I would be interested in joining you um, to try and determine what does our report look like? How much of their report do we use? And what is our report? Right. I mean, what is it that we want to present to the council? Right. So I'd, I'd be glad to yes. join in that, um, assuming that it works timing wise. OK, yeah, if you if you want me. Always, Lori. <laughs> no, I think it's important to make a compelling point and, and back things with research and um, we can do our best and just have the EEC uh, add their comments and then bring it to council. Great, thanks Jill. Any okay. questions, any other questions or comments for Jill? So the next one I think we're done with, is that yeah. status we're finished, good? 
So number three. I'll skip over that. Clover ride, we covered an important part. Did you have others to add, Mindy? Um, the one question, Andrew, you were going to reach out to the residences, and I don't know with the contract coming in if you've had a chance to do that. I forgot to ask you ahead of time. Haven't had a chance to send the letter yet, but I do have a list of, I think it's like 50 plus residential properties in the Southdale area. Um, that the, the gist of the letter is just going to kind of remind all of them that they're within the service area for the service and um, say if they're interested in uh, more information, um, contact me and we can send them more like posters, promotional material. I'd love to send out bus passes to encourage more people to try out the service. And then the other thing was the senior center was doing a drive through. Were we going to put a flyer in their packet of information that they were giving to residents to talk about the Clover ride? It's a little broad in some ways if it's going to go to every person that would do the drive through for the senior center when really it's a limited service area for the Clover ride. I'll be honest, I completely forgot about that. Yeah, at the time, I was thinking it was a great opportunity, and as I was reading it now, I was thinking, oh, wait, that might give us a whole lot of people that um, aren't really along the route that would get information about the Clover ride. So I don't know if it's... Yeah, let me, <laughs> let me check on the timing of that event. I might have missed the deadline for that. Um, but... Might be, because I'd written down May 26th that I think might be the date that they were actually having. So the Senior Center for everyone else is doing a drive through expo so they were just going to hand out like bags with various promotional material and and such to seniors that would just drive by to pick them up but that would of course be open to seniors throughout the city and if our target and if our target audience are those that uh, don't drive um they're less likely to be going to a drive through expo as well <laughs> Right. So otherwise, I we already mentioned that ridership is going up. So I think that's all we had on that one, Kurt. Thank you, Mindy. Thanks for staying on top of all that. I think we can skip four because that was what we just did. Traffic safety. And number five is capital improvement projects for Jill and Andrew. Uh, nothing new as far as I know, Andrew. Uh, no, um, the, uh, again, the, the equity criteria, reviewing the final equity criteria is still the next step on this. Um, that's on hold for now as I wrap up the speed limit implementation plan. But, um, after once that's done, then that will be brought back to the commission. Great. Great. Thank that's you. Good. And then um, number six, there are three traffic studies Andrew sent, collected feedback, and also looks like a follow-up on um, City Council from April 20th for the policy. Um, Andrew, maybe you could cover this one, um, what you found so far. Yeah, I was trying to recall the, there was um, 4913 or 4917 Eden Avenue, which is the Perkins site, um, 4040 Valley View Road, um, which is the north, East corner of the roundabout at Valley View and 70th. Um, was there a third one? I thought 51, those were the. Yeah, 5146 Eden. Right. Yeah, 5146 Eden, which is the old public works site. Yeah. So I got a couple comments on those. Uh, and I, I believe I sent out the final, my final memo that included all of the commissioner comments. Um, we've actually just received studies um, this week for. Uh, two projects in the Pentagon Park area, um, one at 4660 77th and one at 4911 77th. Um, so those memos will be coming out to the commission for review uh, shortly. Okay. So, Andrew, for what you have provided to the city council, what was the feedback on that regarding the travel studies? Uh, some of these, I don't think have gone to council yet. Some, some of, 
some uh, went to planning and are still waiting going to council. Okay. Um, so well, what about the TDM policy though? The TDM policy was approved. Okay. So there's a um, in the in the memos that I write at the at the end, you'll see that there's a um, there's a, a section of the table that identifies what TDM tier they fall into, and then any TDM strategies that that they propose that I think qualify, and then I list out some other suggested TDM strategies. Um, for for example, if they pick, um, or if they propose uh, Eden Avenue, for example, the the Perkins site, I believe they had only one or two TDM strategies that they proposed, um, and they fall into the tier one category, which requires five. So in my memo, I mentioned I mentioned that they should implement at least three of a variety of other TDM suggested TDM strategies. One thing I have noticed also when it comes to the travel travel impact studies and travel demand management for this development, I I I notice a gap between our assessment and the city council's assessment when I listen to their meetings. So, for instance, they, they look at it in a different, at a different angle that I just, where would that data come from for that assessment? From, for, for, for council's assessment, you mean? Exactly. When they talk about the, the 4917 Eden Avenue, mm -hmm. it takes almost over an hour or more. Right, they get deep into it. They look at every angle. And I don't think we do look at it with the same depth. I, I would agree because council is looking at it. I mean, the, the commission and, and, and I am really only looking at it from a, with a transportation lens, whereas council is looking at it from land use, transportation, the, you know, small area plans, um, housing, you know, they have a lot more, a lot other lenses and, and strategic goals and objectives to, to consider when they review these projects. Okay. Even, sorry, I don't want to drag this, but even our citizen residents have a different view of it. That is much more in depth. Okay, can I just ask if there's something that you are wanting to have answered? No, I'm, I'm thinking, how do you close that gap? I want to be able, so when these travel impact studies come to us for a development, when we give an assessment, it's like 95% within the normal distribution of assessment of city council and also the residents that live nearby. And so, what are you wanting to have happen? Sorry, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not getting well, I'm where just you're trying going. To, I'm, no, 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 I get it, Lori. I understand where, <laughs> Sorry. but I'm trying to just, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking out loud. I'm just trying to figure out where that gap, how do we close that gap? I say get on the planning commission, because I think that's where the, that broader view really lives. Hmm. But maybe I'm wrong, Andrew, maybe you can comment on that. Um. I guess I'm not really understanding the question. Let, uh, we'll take it offline. I'll send you a, uh, an email directly. Okay. Anything else on okay. initiative yeah. six? I think, I think that covered, if you've covered everything, Andrew, I think we could move on. Um, and then when you said shortly for those upcoming couple studies, did you have a, a general time range like within the next week or two or 
Um, yes. Uh, one of them, one of the studies I got Tuesday, and so I've just started the memo for that. The other one I got literally this afternoon. Um, so I will try to get those to the commission as soon as I can. Hopefully it should be, should be within the next week. Okay. Thanks. And it looks like the last one, number seven, is for Chris, the Metro Transit connectivity. Yeah, I just started to kind of brainstorm methodology in addition to what we described here. Um, and also welcome the uh, commissioners to provide some feedback or if they'd like to join this initiative as well, just starting to get kind of things formalized. But um, just wanted to confirm my thought process was using like a half mile radius around the proposed E line BRT stations and about a mile radius around the two Green Line stations um, immediately northwest of the city to kind of within those radii see what the existing ped and bike proposed networks are. And then, as it says, just find out if there's any gaps, um, any additional connections that should be made within those radii, um, and then uh, produce some findings for consideration. Welcome feedback on on the direction of this one. I like it. Feels like the right framing and I'd be happy to join me on this one too. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Sounds good. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. And and then um uh do we does the electric vehicles boulevard trees warrant any discussion at this time or should we just continue having those uh, available in the parking lot? Uh, I would say only if someone in the commission wants to propose uh, an, another amendment to the work plan, um, but typically the parking lot items aren't discussed unless there's a proposal to bump them up to an initiative. Okay. I think they're okay there. Any Anybody think otherwise? So Kirk, um, yeah. one, I guess the thing, I, I had really intended to uh, develop a work plan item around the boulevard trees because I feel so strongly about it. Um, but given that next month we start to develop our work plan for 2022, um, it kind of makes sense to not go through the hoops of getting this additional work plan uh, item added for this year. We might as well just, uh, I, I'm kind of thinking it makes more sense mm -hmm. to put it on next year's I mean it should have been started you know 20 years ago but now Great. not sure that six months is going to make much difference and then can you help me refresh my memory did we not get a, a a process memo I think from the city maybe it was yeah about um upcoming events related to boulevard trees do you know what I'm talking about yeah this the didn't they send a survey out of how what ideas yeah. we for staff and yeah, you should have gotten a uh, you should have gotten a survey from Scott Neal. Um, yes. They're looking at scheduling a, a kind of a broad um, kind of educational discussion, open forum type event um, in August to talk more specifically about Boulevard trees. The right. goal being to align that with um, when the commissions are concluding their 22 work plan proposals. Right. The survey was super brief. I don't recall when it ends, but. I participated and it was really easy. So does is that still open? Does anybody recall? If if it is, I encourage everybody to 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 give it um some your input. And where does one find that survey? I know I got it on email, I, I believe. So yeah. that means it probably come from Andrew. Yeah, I'll check it, Andrew? with I'll check with Scott and MJ to see if it's still available. If it is, I'll resend the link out to the to the commission. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good one. Okay. And then after that, we have our advisory um, off street parking. Thank you, uh, several people that worked on that. Um, so this is something where we would review and then um, uh, potentially approve. So uh, first, any discussion on this? 
and those that worked on it more closely, did you want to bring up any clarifying points or background? That was um, Mindy and Chris and I that worked on it with the with the um, always incredible help of Andrew. Um, and uh, you know, I think we all read the the proposed ordinances and we had a few concerns and we wanted to make sure that. So the background, we wanted to reference um, the transportation chapter of the comprehensive plan. And it seems like, Bokar, maybe you remember this. Maybe, Mindy, you remember this. Um, didn't we have something in the in our chapter about um, minimizing surface parking? That, that long term, that, that was a direction we wanted to go. But it doesn't seem to have stayed in the comprehensive plan. So I was looking for it. But these, these two uh, points yeah, that did. Was the main ideas we made sure that was that was to stay right yeah so then we just had these um these proposed changes or you know the concerns that we had had to do with you know reducing off street parking for buildings that are close to transit should actually um have some responsibility to advertise and post about the transit availability and subsidize it um, because that's so consistent with our TEM wishes. Um, it mm -hmm. just, it's kind of a no brainer. Um, the environmental rationale, um, it's like the impervious surface isn't really a huge environmental um, improvement, but uh, electric vehicle charging stations are for example, and, and uh, van pool or other shared vehicle spaces would be. So we recommended switching those out. Um, that long-term bike parking follow the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals um, in terms of um, the, the way in, in which they develop those. Uh, you go to the next page. Thank you. Um, and then this, so for those of you that were on the commission, when, is it, there's a Mediterranean restaurant that's over on France. Rody. Uh, with, yeah, Rody, uh, with parking in the back, and they minimize their off-street parking, and then all of the, the customers for that um, restaurant parked in the neighborhood because they're actually then in the Cornelia neighborhood. And it's like, gosh, we hear so much about parking concerns in the neighborhood, so we just suggested that um, these two possibilities to prevent that from happening, from overflow parking going into the neighborhoods. Um, and then finally, this thing about, well, you know, the, the great, one of the great reasons to allow developers to reduce the amount of parking is that it actually saves them costs. And while it's not within our scope to talk about affordable housing, it's kind of, it would be silly to miss the, the opportunity to make that point, that if there's a way to tie that parking reduction to a reduction in rent specifically for the affordable unit housing units. It's like, we should just at least make that point. So that's what's in there. Did I miss anything, Mindy and Chris? No, oh, that sounds great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the summary. Oh, well, thank you. I really like how you supported everything so clearly. Um, if there are no discussion points, I believe that we would move to uh, make a motion to approve it. I guess if I if I may just to give an update on the <clears throat> the public hearing timing related to this. Um, so if you recall planning who developed these the off street parking ordinance amendments, they held a public hearing um, back in April, I think, um, but didn't have a city council hearing scheduled yet. They, they have one scheduled yet. It's on, um, there's information on the Better Together Edina page. Um, the city council public hearing will be June 15th. And then the uh, public hearing, the comment period will be open until noon on July 12th. And then council is expected to make a final decision on July 21st. So if, if the commission votes to approve this communication tonight, um, I'll put it on the June 1st agenda. So city council will receive it one meeting before the public hearing. That'd be good. Well, thanks for that timing, Andrew. Okay, anything else? Would anybody like to make a motion to approve it as written? I have a question. Sounds like everybody thinking through this. While everybody thinking, 
if we pass ordinances, like for instance, roti, right? They had, a, if we would have made concessions for the additional need of parking in those streets, and then let's say roti go, any businesses goes out of business, and we implement changes based on temporary situation that can have like this, what would happen to our policy? Because with the pandemic, things change. You have a business there, you create a lot of signage, a lot of additional parking, then suddenly something happens. How do you account for that? Andrew? <laughs> I guess, um... It would depend on the so in the example you mentioned, like if if Roti were to go or to close, and another business were to come and operate in the same space, but have the you know whatever parking is there right now, um, if it's a change in use proposed use, like if it was something other than a restaurant, um, it would have to get a either a zoning change or a conditional use permit or some there'd be some process for it to be reviewed by the city. At which point we would look at whether or not they have sufficient parking to support that proposed use. If it's a restaurant, one restaurant going closing and another restaurant opening, that's a little bit different because um, there may, depending on what type, there may not necessarily be a mechanism for us to relook at whether they have sufficient parking. Am I recalling correctly that Roti was actually the other way around, that originally it was scoped with the parking for retail or office use and then it became a restaurant yes that's what i remember too yeah and that somehow there wasn't a review then through that process of the parking right if i if my recollection is right i thought the study had made some vague mention of the possibility of a restaurant and then there was some language in there about recommended limit to the seating capacity given how much yeah. Um, parking they were proposing. Um, so I believe that that cap to their space was uh, implemented. But as you've mentioned, we did still get complaints about off street parking spilling off into the neighborhood. And as I recall, we changed the parking restrictions then on those city streets, which meant changes to signage, which therefore was some cost to the city uh, to accommodate this. Correct. Yeah, I just don't okay. want us to make temporary changes, you know, maybe uh, district parking, I don't know. Just nowadays things change pretty quick when it comes to businesses. So just don't want us spending too much money and then it's a temporary fix. So Kirk or Andrew, I'm not sure who the right person to ask this. Is it um, is it kosher for one of us who worked on this to um, to move to approve, or should we stay out of the motion? Oh, I I, I move to approve it. Not a problem. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. So moved. Um, um, uh, I, oh, we do that roll call. Yeah, I'm getting tired. Yeah. I, I sorry, I just I okay, so moved by Bokar, seconded by Lori. To answer the question, um yes, one of you could have moved it or seconded it, um, because there's not a there's not a quorum of you to be able to pass it without everybody else. Does that if does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah. All right. Moved by Bokar, seconded by Lori. Uh any other discussion? Uh, roll call vote, Commissioner Aller? Aye. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Chair Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Kane? Aye. Commissioner Lewis? Aye. Commissioner Plum Smith? Aye. Commissioner Richmond? Aye. Approved. Real good. Thank you Excellent. to those that participated in that. There's some great recommendations in there. Yes, agreed. Yeah. Chris and Mindy were wonderful. Um, 
Chris has the eye for detail, like nobody's business. It was awesome. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, really good thinking. Mindy's got the historical perspective of the things we, we have addressed. So it was a good group. And Lori kept us all corralled and yeah. moving forward. That was much appreciated. To completion. Way to go, team. I'm looking forward to seeing where uh, where city council goes with this. Yeah. Okay, next is chair and member comments. Mindy? Um, yeah. Um, a couple things. One, I attended the, the workshop on uh, removing freeways that was done by Move Minneapolis. Um, they sponsored a number of speakers. It was quite fascinating about around the concept of um, what freeways have done historically and how there is a move in some places to move the, to remove them or make those spaces more accessible by things such as putting lids over the freeways. So I just thought it was like, you know, we really were at least forward thinking and I think ahead of our time uh, in Edina proposing that. Um, and the second second thing is in in reference to the climate action plan. I have now joined the team that's working on the city's climate action plan. Um, and um, boulevard trees actually have come up in our discussion. So, because <laughs> I one of the sub teams that I'm on is the transportation and land use uh, sub team, because that obviously makes a lot of sense with the transportation commission. Um, so in the future, I may ask for some other ideas. Uh, during this time period. Uh, but the big thing right now is there are surveys both for youth and for um, adult and other community members um, regarding the climate action plan that we'd like to encourage people to take. And it's on Better Together Edina, um, just under the project for the climate action plan. Um, and after I finish my comments, I'll find the link at least to that spot on Better Together Edina for the whole climate action plan. It's the first two items to take the surveys. But I'll stick that in the chat in just a minute here. And that's it. Chris? Uh, I have no comments tonight. Thank you. Okay. Well, just uh, I participated today. Uh, MJ and uh, Scott Neal were running the uh, American Rescue Fund Act that um, Edina have received. I think it's about 4.9 million to help. I think uh, it'd be great for everybody to go and participate through Better Together Edina. So we went through a process where we looked at how do you spend the money? What would the citizen want to see this money be spent on? So I think it'd be great for everybody to go and look at it. That's all I have. Great. Andy? Oh, Bokar, is that that space on Better Together Edina where people can add their ideas? Uh, or is there another process as well? So the first meeting happened today, this afternoon at 4 p.m. at Centennial Lake. That was an in person meeting, which limited, I think, seating. There's also another meeting happening in June that you can do virtually. But you also, I think, through Better Together Edina, you should be able to participate from what MJ have said. I haven't validated that, but I trust what she said. Thank you. Yeah. Andy? No comment. Thank you. Jill? Um, did we ever talk about the internal website and emails and getting that up and running? Uh, not today. We haven't. No. Okay. So, is there any way that we can start to launch that and add people as they're interested? It the site is up and running, and seven commissioners so far have been added to the group. Um, so they should all be able. Those of you that have sent me your Better Together Edina account information should be able to view the page when you log in. But I don't know where to find it. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't. I don't. It's not yes. obvious, so I must be missing something. I'm, I'm do you, Andrew, it. do you think you could send a, a note just dedicated to that to everybody and with the link, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. I think I'll, I might have talked to MJ because I'm because I'm an admin user, so my interface probably looks a little different than what you're seeing. Okay. Um, but yes, I will. 
talk to MJ and send out more information about how to uh, how to access it. Great, thanks. Um, my only other comment is uh, I missed the handlebar mustache. Gotta be honest. I do not miss it. <laughs> I thought it was stylish. Anyway, thank you. Lori? Uh, thanks for bringing that up, Jill. Um, I think I still, I, even though I've sent my email information, I think I still don't have access to it. Um, so I'm hope, I mean, I just looked and I can't see where to get onto our page. So I must not have access to it. Um, I just had two other sort of quick things. Um, Andrew, you're probably going to talk about the speed limit implementation or, you know, what that looks like. Um, what I'm wondering is there are no speed limits on 58th Street since the reconstruction. Um, and I'm not kidding. Cars go, it's so narrow and cars go so fast. Even if there were temporary speed limit signs on there, I, I think that would help. I, I get that those might change. It was 25 miles an hour. It seems like it might be 25 miles an hour, anything, but there's nothing there. So that's one. Um, yay, thank you for uh, getting that, it, whatever role you might have played in getting the um, the lights at 58th and France functional. And they're- I, uh, I didn't, I didn't, okay. to be honest. I okay. didn't play a role in that. Well, they're great. Um, and then uh, the only other question I have, and uh, maybe you're going to talk about this in, in staff comments. Um, well, the first one is, is everybody vaccinated? And the second one is, when do we get to meet in person again? Because I really look forward to seeing you people in person again. I'm with you. Uh, so, yes, I can check with design and construction about the speed limit signs on 58th. Um, and then I'll talk about in person, the transition to in person meetings and my staff comments. Okay, thank you. And, and when I say uh, 58th, I mean both sides of France. Yep. Okay, real good. Thank you. Anna? Uh, nothing for me. Anand? Nothing for me either. Kirk? Nothing else. Thank you. All right, staff comments. So I'll start with the speed limit implementation update. Um, so by my estimate, we have uh, to about 250 signs that need to be either added or replaced um, to, to implement the 25 mile an hour. Um, we've had meetings with public works, police and communications to talk about um, the sign installation schedule, talk about enforcement and talk about community education. Um, the I'm planning to bring the implementation plan to council in June for their approval. And then uh, we're going to go out to a third party to uh, purchase the signs uh, and then public works will install them kind of quadrant by quadrant. Um, at this point, we're expecting it'll take a, roughly a month per quadrant starting in August. So the goal is by the end of the year to have all of the new speed limits implemented. Um, and then again, we'll be working with police and communications to um, get the word out through our social media channels, through all of our other communication channels. Uh, and we're working with the police department on um, kind of their anticipated enforcement strategy um, and how they will be involved in um, the community education component of it. A um, couple updates on a couple projects we're working on with Hennepin County. Um, the Vernon Avenue bridge over CP rail is going to be scheduled to be replaced in 2023. There's now a project page up for that on better together. Edina um, staff has been working with the county to look to um, kind of redo evaluate the layout of that section. Um, we're look as part of that project. We're looking to widen the sidewalks on Vernon between interlocking and highway 100. Um, we're proposing or the county's proposing to remove the southbound to westbound free right off of highway 100. So that'll just move to a right turn at the signal. Um, and then uh, there's a recommendation to add a dedicated westbound left turn lane onto Gus Young Lane at that at the intersection of Interlochen and Vernon. Um, so, like I said, there's a there's a page on better together for this project. Um, Hennepin County is hosting a virtual open house now through the end of June. Um, if you want to review uh, what's being proposed right now and uh, provide comments, um, 
everyone, anyone is free to do so through the end of June. And then the county is also looking at doing pavement resurfacing on France Avenue between 50th Street and Excelsior as uh, in the same year, 2023. Um, as part of that project, they're starting to investigate adding bike lanes on France Avenue for that corridor um, in part to connect to um, the uh, Southwest LRT in the future, um, but also to connect to, I think it's the Cedar Lake Trail, which is like a block or two north of on France from Excelsior. So Hennepin County is will be leading a community engagement effort um, to talk with property owners in that area. Um, obviously, on street bike lanes would mean having to make significant changes to the on street parking that's available in that corridor. Um, and that could particularly impact um, some of the residents along that street, as well as the business districts at 50th in France and 44th in France. Um, so more to come on that project. Um, when did you say that? Um, is planned for reconstruction for the the actual 2020 2023 is when construction of the bridge and the pavement resurfacing on France is scheduled. Both are 2023. And is it on Better Together Edina already? The France Avenue one is not um, okay. because the county is still kind of developing their community engagement strategy, but there is a page for the Vernon Avenue bridge. Now, the France Avenue one is our neighborhood, and I know that my neighborhood will be very interested in that. So, yes, yes, we've, besides we've, there's also overlap with the with the rapid bus, the E line, yes, in that yep. same corridor. Yep, Metro Transit is isn't uh, has been involved in these conversations as well. Um, the, some of you may know the city recently tested a closure of the southbound 100 ramp off Eden Avenue. Um, that. It's it's open now, and we've gotten the results back from the study. Um, the short of it is that the observations support removal of that ramp. Um, there were no significant traffic operation changes or uh, detriments or safety concerns that were raised. Um, there's some additional traffic on Vernon Avenue that it causes, obviously, since that's where people get onto Southbound 100. Um, and there's some recommended signal timing updates on Vernon that would be needed in order to make that change. Um, but this, the city is uh, continuing to work with MnDOT to look at uh, removal of that ramp um, tied to the construction of a roundabout at Eden Avenue and Arcadia. Um, that's And right now that's somewhere in the five year time frame. So fingers crossed in five years that we can uh, remove that ramp. Uh, I've been working with Metro Transit on the uh, Orange Line connecting bus study. The Orange Line is the BRT service that will run from Minneapolis to Burnsville along 35W. As part of that connecting bus plan, um, Metro Transit is proposing to extend local route 552, which runs on West 78th Street on the far southwest corner of the city. They're proposing to extend that up the frontage road to Braemar Arena and basically use Braemar Arena as a, a turnaround location, um, which I think is a great way to um, improve transit access in the Southwest corridor um, and potentially to encourage more people to work at Bray Marina because they'll be, uh, they can take the bus to get there and back. Um, so we're, um, we're looking at putting together a, a site use agreement with Metro Transit and parks um, to basically say that they're allowed to, to park there and to use, you know, the drivers can use the restrooms and things like that. Um, that is going to council in June and that, if approved, um, that service would begin to operate in December of this year. Uh, I sent an email out, I can't remember if it was today or yesterday, but about the city's looking for representatives for the Human Services Task Force. Um, this is something the city does uh, every year. Um, we appropriate $80,000 from the general fund to pay for human service agencies to provide outsourced services to Edina residents. So as part of that, that uh, to help allocate that money, the city puts the other task force with uh, ideally one representative from each board and commission. So we're looking for a representative from the commission who may be interested. Um, I shared a letter. It's about a six month commitment with uh, meetings about once a month. Um, if you're interested, let me know um, uh, if I get one or more people that are interested. Then at the next meeting, we'll vote to 
formally approve somebody to, to, to appoint to that position. And then the, so the return to in person meetings. So, um, where the city will be required to move back to in person meetings starting July 1st. Uh, when the governor's order expires. So it's anticipated that all of the boards and commissions will return to in person meetings in July. Um, council will also go back July 20th, but obviously some boards and commissions will meet in person before that. Staff is working on developing a procedure for moving back in person. Um, we do have some flexibility to allow people to, um, to attend remotely for July and August. Um, if they have a medical concern for themselves or a family member, um, the city will continue to provide opportunities for online public comments um, and will develop a process for uh, remote comments for community comments and public hearings um, in the future. And the staff liaison will be required to attend in person. So I'll, I will be at the in person meetings. Um, other than that, there's uh, that's about all I have. More information on that topic uh, is yet to come. Um, are there any any questions on returning to in person meetings? Where would they be held at? Good question. So our in person meetings are typically held in the community room at City Hall, which is uh, upstairs and way in the back. If you go up the stairs and all the way down the hallway, it's the last room on the left. Andrew, with how well this has gone, in my opinion, I think it's gone really well virtually. Let's say in the future, somebody really wants to participate, but is out of town. Given what we've learned, would there be any provision for someone to participate um, in full capacity with the meeting, even though the rest of us might be in the community room? At, at this point, we're tied to the state statute, um, which again, right now, right now allows us to do this because of the emergency order. But when that expires in July, there'll only be like a two month buffer period between in July and August where some members can still attend virtually. But unless there's a, unless there's a, um, a change in the statute, the voting members of the body will be required to be in person. Um, those that are not voting, so members of the public or um, if we have special guests give presentations, they likely in the future will be able to do those remotely without having to physically be at the meeting. Um, but again, those those details are kind of still being worked out. That, that also potentially gives that option to our student commissioners. Which sometimes coming to City Hall has been a barrier for their attendance and I see that as another potential opportunity to help students be more engaged. So, Andrew, um, as, um, as the staff looks at what that implementation might look like, um, I'm hoping that there will be some aspect of, um, of having folks be vaccinated in order to uh, participate in person um, and or providing a meeting location that allows for uh, distancing or even requires masks. So it's possible that maybe the, the big community room at the public works building might be an option instead of the community room at city hall or whatever. Um, but, it, but I would hope that there would be some provision around, um, or I don't know if I say expectation, but something around vaccination. Cause I know yeah. some folks have young kids at home and they're not being vaccinated. I mean, you know, people have different reasons for, wanting to make sure that they're not carriers, even if they're not getting it themselves. Yeah, it, at this point, staff is staff has been told not to ask people for their vaccination uh, yep. history. Um, it's it's not something that we're able to to ask or require at this point. Um, yep. But that is certainly something I can pass along to the staff group that's working on it. And I think your your comment about allowance for social distancing, I think that's also a good thing for them to consider. Real good. I look forward to seeing all you people <laughs> in person. Um, any other question on returning to work? Otherwise, I just or returning to in person. Otherwise, I just have two other quick updates. Would there be a, a required attire since we would be in person? Then? 
No, there, uh, there's not a address code. Okay, thank you. Just come in in tuxedos. Don't let, don't let Chris's attire fool you. Dress for success. <laughs> um, so otherwise, the last two updates, like MJ said, uh, 2022 work plan development will begin next month. So there'll be a, a discussion item on the agenda for that. Um, so start thinking about initiatives that you want to propose for the, for the coming year. Um, those work plans will need to be uh, voted, voted on and approved by the September meeting. So you have September, July, August, sorry, June, July, August, September to discuss and, and uh, consider your work plan for next year. Um, and then the last one is our next meeting will be Thursday, uh, June seventeenth at six p.m. Thank you, Andrew. Looks like we're ready to adjourn. So, unless there is there any other discussion or points, otherwise we can move to that. Would anybody like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second. Andrew, roll call. Commissioner Aller? Aye. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Chair Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Kane? Aye. Commissioner Lewis? Aye. Commissioner Plum Smith? Aye. Commissioner Richmond? Aye. We stand adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Aye. Have a great rest of the night. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Well.